all right. Good morning. We're about to get started. Hey everyone, don't know if you can hear me yet, but uh, we're about to get started. Um, give me a quick minute, just making a quick few notes, and we'll start in just a second. start in one minute. to philosophy class. Uh, I know yesterday you guys had to turn in your IUE. Uh, hopefully that went well. Uh, the Core 12 teachers are actually uh, meeting today via Zoom to uh, go over your IUEs. Um, here, let me set this up really quickly so you can see me. Hi. <laughs> okay. So, uh, like I said uh, yesterday, you know, IUEs, uh, hopefully those uh, went well. Um, just keep an eye out for announcements. Like I said, uh, we have a big meeting today, uh, myself and the Core 12 teachers. In, in fact, um, all the teachers have a big meeting today via Zoom. Uh, so I'll keep you updated on uh, what's going on, uh, any policies, you know, changes, anything like that. So uh, a couple exciting things. I got an Ethernet cable, uh, so hopefully the connection will be a little bit better. Um, and you can hear me well and everything, so you know, we're kind of constantly improving. I uh, also have a prop today. So, yeah, we're gonna get crazy with the whiteboard. Uh, have a presentation and all that. Um, yeah, so uh, just a quick schedule change. Uh, lecture will be at 10 o'clock in the morning, every morning, Monday through Friday. Uh, immediately followed will be my office hours via Zoom. Uh, the link is on Schoology, and I'll also at the end of this uh, lecture be giving you a link on um, uh, the YouTube chat. Uh, afterwards, I will upload this video onto YouTube, uh, make it public so that anybody can watch it later. Uh, I hope you guys are all doing well. We're in uh, week two of our um, quarantine from school, and uh, hopefully you guys are staying uh, safe, uh, healthy, uh, practicing social distancing, washing your hands, and uh, doing everything you need to do to make sure that we get over this crisis as soon as possible. Uh, for my part, I uh, have been uh, talking with uh, Mr. Silva, and so I'm expecting a little bit more of you today, uh, the other side as well. We are beginning Unit 4, and uh, this isn't the way I imagined we'd do it, but you know, gotta roll with the punches. So uh, unit four for me, if I had to boil it down to one word, it is postmodernism. Uh, it's a bit loaded word and I'll be using it here and there sparingly, but um, for those of you in SI, uh, you will continue to be with Mr. Silva uh, for the rest of um, uh, this unit. That'll be uh, until uh, late April. Uh, we'll give you specific dates as we, uh, as we um, uh, solidify them. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if you're in philosophy, I will give lectures uh, via YouTube, um, kind of what I've been doing before. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, let me think. Uh, 
yeah, I think that's all the announcements. I, I, will, I will keep you updated once uh, I have my meeting with the teachers uh, later this afternoon. Uh, the discussion board for today has already been posted. It's actually a thought experiment that we're going to tackle uh, together today. So if you want to, uh, you know, pay attention. In fact, I would highly recommend that you take notes today. Um, you know, either writing them down, just jotting them down on a piece of paper or in a Google Doc, you know, however you prefer, just so you can kind of keep track of what's going on. Uh, the philosopher that I'm going to introduce today is going to be the most important one for this unit, and specifically as it relates to my class and Mr. Silva's. Uh, Mr. Silva's going to be using a lot of fancy words like panopticon and surveillance, and I want to make sure that you guys all understand what that means. Uh, okay. And also on a personal note, well, of course I miss you guys um, and I miss school, uh, but we have to do the best that we can. And, uh, you know, I'm here to support you. If you ever want to uh, just talk, you know, we can schedule a Zoom meeting um, or, uh, you know, we can just uh, email each other, whatever it is you need. So again, hopefully you're staying safe, healthy and uh, sane. So I know, I know. Let's see, uh, let's, looking at some of the comments. Uh, I know, yeah, the vibes aren't quite the same. Uh, it's a little hard to, you know, make fun of you uh, without being face to face, but again, I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, uh, my dogs are asleep right now, uh, but <laughs> if they uh, wake up, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bring them over. Okay, are you guys ready? Give me some uh, indication that you are ready to commence in the chat box, and then we'll get started. Yeah, there's a little bit of a delay still, but it's I, th I think it's better than it was before. Um, okay, it looks like you guys are ready to go. Cool. All right, then let's begin. <clears throat> All right, let me go ahead and set the, the PowerPoint, and oh, bingo, here we go. All right, folks, so I have posted up the reading. Again, this is for philosophy, uh, specifically for the kids on my side, but uh, everyone else, you'll get this eventually. In fact, I've posted on all the classes under the Fuentes folder, uh, Unit 4, Postmodernism. The philosopher that we're gonna begin is Foucault. The question that we're gonna be asking is, are we rational animals making progress or are we deceiving ourselves? So the reading, like I said, is uh, available on um, uh, Schoology, just make sure that you, um, you know, the PDF. Oh, a note, I put study questions up for Foucault. I will not be assigning study questions. I, I thought about it and I thought, you know what, the discussion boards are enough just for you to check. So the study uh, questions are there to serve as a study guide if you wish to use them to uh, make better sense of the packet. They are good to kind of help you follow along with the reading, but you do not need to turn them in for me. I repeat, they are optional. The study questions are not a homework assignment. All right, then I'm excited. So, Foucault. And, and by the way, uh, the way you pronounce his name is, yes, he's very French, Foucault, but I digress. Whew. Is it? This is the last stretch, the final unit of the year. And again, none of us imagined it would be delivered like this, but again, we do the best we can. Take good notes, pay attention, and you may actually be able to apply what you learn today to your everyday life. And trust me, uh, I think you actually can. Uh, and I know you're like, wait, we're fine, we're in a quarantine. I know, but we're not going to be in a quarantine forever. And what this guy has to say about society and about, uh, uh, well, specifically the way he critiques a modern society, I think is very insightful. Or maybe not, but I at least wanted to present them to you and then you can make up your own mind. Let's see. So again, today, Foucault, we are going to be introducing him and an overview of his project. For those of you in philosophy, the homework tonight is to read the first two pages of the packet and answer discussion board number six, which has already been posted on Schoology. Let's begin. I'll give you a second. Oh, and today's the 24th, by the way. It is Tuesday. Uh, I know it's, it might get a little hard to keep track of the days. If you haven't already, I would highly recommend making a schedule or routine for yourself um, so you can maintain some discipline and, uh, you know, maintain your sanity uh, being locked up indoors all day. So here we go. Introduction. I think one of the best ways to introduce him is with a little video. Uh, some of you guys may have already seen this or may be familiar with the School of Life video. Uh, it's not very long, it's about eight minutes and a half, um, but I want to give you uh, just a nine minute window to be able to watch it. So I've posted, right now I'm about to, 
posted the link to the video. Uh, it's an introduction to Foucault. So please go ahead and watch it and we'll reconvene in nine minutes. Go ahead, enjoy.
Alright, and we're about to get started again. Okay. Okay, hopefully you had time to watch the video. Um, yeah, quite a guy. Uh, so Foucault is a very famous, uh, more contemporary philosopher, and he is still really influential in colleges today. Um, if you take any humanities classes in college, I guarantee you you'll hear him mentioned. Um, he's had a lot of influence, and, and you see how um, Sartre, you know, had personal impact on him and uh, knew him personally, and uh, uh, he was also heavily influenced by, you, know, you guessed it, Wittgenstein. Uh, Wittgenstein is the one that leads to a lot of these postmodern theories. So what you just saw is a very grand overview of Foucault, and we'll be touching on that in the week to come. So uh, this guy, highly intellectual, highly revolutionary, and most of all, highly critical. So let's get started. So Michel Foucault, 1926 to 1984. French philosopher and historian that was mostly interested not by events, but by the uh, human subject. His ideas are commonly labeled as postmodern, though he himself would disagree with the label. Postmodernism is a really loaded term, and uh, any philosopher that you would call postmodern, uh, Foucault, Derrida, Rorty, um, disagrees like, oh, I'm not postmodern, I'm, you know, something else. Um, he's simply lumped in with those guys, but he is pretty unique. Um, oh, a note on, on Foucault. Uh, yeah, he was he was gay, and uh, unfortunately, in '84 he died uh, in the uh, AIDS epidemic um, that occurred back then. Um, yeah. Now, his most enduring work deals with the relationship between knowledge and oh, this very important word, power. What he has to say about power has really influenced, especially modern critical uh, theory um, uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, for instance, I mean, almost anything that has to do with uh, the humanities, especially the fields of history, uh, the fields of philosophy, and especially the fields of ethnic and gender and sexuality studies have really been impacted by what Foucault has had to say. Um, so let's see a few comments here. Uh, Let's see, uh, yes, Ethan, capitalism is bad, according to Foucault. Or at the very least, it creates a system that deprives people of freedom and happiness. Uh, Diksha, uh, oh, yeah, I suppose in that sense, he and Wittgenstein are similar, sad, gay, white guys, yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, he was an intense guy, for sure. Uh, but I think what he has to say is pretty valuable, and... Oh gosh, when you think about what's happening right now with the current uh, pandemic, you know, COVID-19, and uh, especially how our governments are responding to it, uh, our society, our economy, uh, maybe Foucault was right. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go over his theories. Now, Foucault was really interested in one really big important question. What he spent most of his life studying and theorizing was, what is it like? to live as a human being today in a contemporary modern society? What is it like to be a human being? I mean, for us, that's a very hard question to answer. I mean, what is it like to live as a human being today? That's gonna to be a big question that he always, always try to answer. Let's try and tackle that with a thought experiment. What I'm going to present to you is a thought experiment, and by the way, this is the what's actually on the um, uh, the discussion board for today. And so, ooh, uh, sorry, little. Uh, it's on the discussion board for today, and uh, it's a really famous thought experiment initially created by uh, Plato. And so, uh, let's get into it. I'll read it to you. I'll give you a second to think about it and uh, type out a little response to it in the chat box, just really quick, because you're going to have time to tackle this in more detail. Uh, in the um, uh, in the discussion board. This is a question regarding human nature. So let's see what you think. And this has a lot to do with how we treat people in a society. One day, a farmer, quite an ordinary man by all respects, is walking by his fields when he notices something glinting in the dirt. Reaching down to pick it up, he is amazed to find an exquisite ring. Almost instinctively, he tries it on. And when he does, he finds that the ring turns him invisible and undetectable. He contemplates how he could use it. If he wanted to, he could commit all manner of immoral acts and not receive any consequences for them. Nobody would catch him. How do you think the farmer will act with the ring? In other words, how do you think most people would act and why? Take a minute, think about it. Let's just get a really quick discussion going. Like I said, you're gonna be able to tackle this in much more detail on the discussion board today. Uh, yes, Adam, we're, I'm going to make that comment a lot. We do live in a society. So how do you think most people... 
escritura. talk about that in a moment, Ethan. Rousseau versus another philosopher. Well, you know, if I had to uh, kind of give you a dichotomy, you know, obviously it's not this simple, but if I had to give you a dichotomy, do you think the farmer would do good things, you know, do the right thing, act responsibly with the ring? Or do you think he just, you know, go ham with it uh, and just kind of do whatever he wanted? And I apologize, I guess there is still a little bit of a delay. Oh wow, okay, I see... <laughs> I see most of you think he would act in, a, uh, in an immoral way, or at the very least in a way that goes against societal conventions. Um, yikes, maybe you're right. Uh, Plato certainly thought so. When Plato wrote this as a story, so he wrote it as an allegory in one of his uh, dialogues, um, he personally, the way the story ends with this farmer who finds the ring of Gygus, uh, Gygus was, was the guy, was, was the name of the farmer. Uh, when Gygus uh, finds the ring, he decides to um, use it to start stealing things, and it escalates, and eventually he ends up uh, killing the king and marrying the queen. Yeah. The view, obviously proposed here through the Ring of Gygus, is a field that, a point of view that most philosophers, uh, political philosophers, have taken, and that is when a human being is allowed to act without any fear of consequence, almost all of the time they will act self-interestedly and immorally. Maybe there's some golden virtuoso, some 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 uh, person just filled with goodness and virtue that would act well. Um, but it's doubtful. Uh, most people, I think, would not act well. Uh, in fact, when you think about it, what is the moral thing to do? Um, oh, one of my dogs here. Wait, come here. Oh, sad. Oh, 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 oh. I mean, a dog. Oh, oh. Uh, in that way, we are kind of like other animals. I mean, we would probably. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Oh my God, chill, 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 chill. <laughs> Um, you know, other animals, uh, we're not that different from them. I mean, every animal is kind of inherently self-interested um, when you think about it. And so, uh, you know, what then do you have to do to keep people in line? Um, again, maybe out of like all of you here, maybe one or two of you would do the right thing. And in fact, what is the right thing to do with the Ring of Gygus? Well, probably get rid of it or destroy it. Oh, and if this story sounds familiar to you, yeah, it was a direct inspiration for Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. Uh, so, another Lord of the Rings reference for y'all. Um, but yeah, it seems that most of you, based on the comments, uh, say that would agree and say that, yeah, most people would act pretty horrible with the ring. Uh, they would act immorally because they no longer have a fear of consequences. Maybe, maybe. This does get back to a really old debate that you guys actually learned about in 10th grade. Hobbes versus Rousseau. So if you guys recall, super quick recap, Hobbes uh, believed that human beings are by nature evil uh, and selfish, whereas Rousseau thought, no, by nature we're good and selfless and, and altruistic and kind. And this has been a debate going on and on and on and on and on for, for centuries, I mean millennia really. Are human beings by nature evil or, or good? Now, even though both these philosophers have been highly influential in their own way, I mean, I don't want to discount either of them, especially not Rousseau's impact on, on um, political philosophy, but to be totally honest with you, most people and most societies and most governments tend to go with Hobbes. Uh, they assume, and they think it's safer to assume, that people will be selfish and stupid and uh, interested uh, in themselves. Uh, you take a look at the uh, toilet paper craze and uh, you might think, well, maybe they're right. Um, so, okay, I wanted to start with that as a way to frame Foucault's political philosophy and as a way to view his uh, view on, on um, how we interact with other people. Because we start with from a negative place. We start from an assumption that people are self-interested and ugly and horrible unless they are kept in line. 
a very Hobbesian approach to human nature. Okay, let me take a quick, quick, quick break. I just want to see how everyone's doing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. My dog came in for a second. I just saw that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And if you recall, John Locke was a tabula rasa. That's right. Uh, a blank slate, um, which, which is also, you know, a totally different point of view. But I think most of us would agree, like, yeah, it's, it's tough to trust people. Um, now, this is the way that Foucault would uh, um, conclude. So Foucault's conclusion was this. We are nature's self-deceiving, power-hungry animal. That's a very negative view of human nature. But he does disagree with Hobbes in one very important way. We're not innately self-deceiving and power-hungry. We are not born that way. We are socialized to behave in this way. So by nature, you are not born to be selfish and, and stupid and self-interested, he claims. No, Foucault says you're trained. You're socialized to act in that way. And, uh, well, let's see if he's right. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to give you a few definitions now, and I would really suggest that you uh, either jot them down and make a quick note, because um, obviously I'm going to make this PowerPoint available eventually, but I'm still editing it, and um, I want to be able to make sure it's done before I post uh, the entirety of it on Schoology. So I'd really suggest that you kind of just take a quick note, a few quick notes. Now, power is a really strange word, and Foucault is a kind of an odd definition. He defines power as the multiplicity of force relations within the social body. Okay, that's a very, very, very abstract definition. Uh, maybe it'll help if I contrast it to a common sense definition. So according to Foucault, that's power, not the capacity of agents to carry out their will over another, nor a property or effect of an institution or structure. Okay, that may have confused you more, let me explain. So I'm going to be going over this again and again, by the way, especially uh, when you guys uh, switch over to philosophy or for those of you currently in philosophy now. But essentially, power is not an ability of like one person or even one institution to get you to do something. That's not really what power is. What Foucault pointed out, and I think he's right, is power is more of a relationship. Um, in, you know, the, a, a master-slave relationship, um, power is not the ability of the master to get the slave to do what he wants. Power is the relationship between the master and the slave. And so when you think about it in that way, um, everyone participates. Everyone participates in power relationships. Uh, masters and slaves alike, uh, peers, um, uh, friends, uh, uh, parents, uh, teachers. Everyone participates in a relationship of power. That's what power is. It's the relationships we find ourselves in. Now, are they equal? Obviously not. And Foucault is going to point, is going to point that out pretty uh, succinctly, especially in a modern uh, capitalist society. Um, but what I want you to start thinking is, okay, power is not like this imposition onto someone else, like in uh, the case of institutionalized racism. Power is not the ability for white people to do this and that. Power is the relationship between white people and people of color. Uh, that's what power actually is. It, it's a much more nuanced view of it, and we'll go over it in much more detail later on. I just want to introduce you to the to the vocab now. So power, let, let, I'll, and I'll explain. I'll provide some examples as we go along. I know it's a little little much right now. Okay, so uh, let's talk about our society. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I'm sure you've been uh, reading or seeing. Uh, uh, you know, the traffic's in, uh, in LA has really been uh, manageable, I think below average. Um, well, I mean, uh, that's interesting, uh, but usually, you know, this is what the 405 looks like. Anyway, uh, when you apply what Foucault is saying to our society, when you think about, okay, what are the power structures, the power relationships in our society? Um, you know, how does power work? Uh, what does it look like, et cetera, et cetera. Let's explore that in our society. I wanna begin with this question. <clears throat> What guides our institutions? Is it contingency or reason? Let me explain. Contingency is the idea that things are random, without purpose, without reason. Things just kind of happen, you know, randomly pop up. And yeah, you can kind of trace back root causes, but ultimately things just kind of happen. 
Or are things kind of like reasonably planned out? Or is there a progress? Are we marching towards a, a greater world, a utopia, a better tomorrow? I think, especially now in these great times of pessimism, uh, most of you would probably say, oh, everything's contingent, random. But for a very long time, we assumed that we were heading towards reason. We assumed that our institutions, our people, our societies were becoming more and more reasonable. Remember, Foucault, besides being a philosopher, was a historian. He was very interested in seeing the development of uh, societies, uh, people, particularly in the West. And in the West, we have a huge bias towards thinking that reason is the way we should uh, uh, shape ourselves. Reason as a, as a guiding light. Reason as our guiding light? Well, you know, this all started with the Enlightenment. Uh, since the Enlightenment, uh, people have, in the West especially, have thought like, oh, well, if we can get more rational, if we can become, uh, you know, better users of reason, then our governments will improve, our, our, our people will improve, our, our, our doctors will improve, our, our philosophy will improve, our education will improve. If we can make everything more reasonable and scientific and, and planned and meticulous, everything will be better. We are getting to a utopia. All of this started again with the rationalists. In fact, if you want to blame one guy, another French philosopher. But the rationalists, and, and even though there's been lots of criticism against them, you know, all the existentialists, you know, uh, Wittgenstein, et cetera, et cetera, there's still this bias towards like, oh, you know, we're, we're, gui we're kind of guided by reason. Again, I want to, you know, say that with the caveat that I think in today's very cynical times, maybe not anymore. I think people are becoming a little bit more awake to this idea that maybe we're not guided by reason. So, reason is a guiding light. Foucault would say, that's laughable. Very laughable. Uh, it's, 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 it's not the way it works. I and mean, when you consider the horrors of the 20th century alone, I mean, when you think about the World Wars, um, the Holocaust, uh, and now when you think of the 21st century, when you think about all the awful things happening right now, including this global pandemic, is reason really a guiding light for us? Seems unlikely. And when you really think about it, let's think historically now. How much have we really improved as a society and as a people? Yeah, 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 we have smartphones and stuff, we have the internet, we have all this awesome technology, but are we really better off than the people in the past? Don't we deal with a whole new slew of problems? And don't we tend to create one or two new problems for each one that we solve? Again, this is highly critical, highly cynical, and very indicative of Foucault's philosophy. I think, I mean, think about it. It, it, it. Are we actually better off? We have this bias of thinking like, oh, thank God, you know, we're living in the in the 21st century or we have all this technology and reason and science. You know, oh, we're so much better off than peasants were in, you know, medieval Europe. And Foucault's going to say, yeah, in some ways, I'm sure, yeah, but maybe not in others. In fact, maybe some things have stayed the same or maybe some things have gotten worse. Um, when we get into especially the birth of the prison, and how prisons have uh, been used as a modern way to tackle you know, the problem of crime in a society, uh, you'll note that uh, we assume that we're more benign and more humanitarian, but are we really? Uh, is this just an illusion? Foucault is really trying to, look, uh, to get us to look critically uh, at uh, our, our institutions and our uh, societies and ourselves as well. I mean, and when you really think about it, you know, uh, I mean, guys, it's hard not to think about what we're experiencing right now. And when you think about all the problems that we're facing, uh, uh, are we really a rational society? And is reason really the only uh, way to progress forward? Now, before you accuse me of being an anti-rationalist or anti-science, I and Foucault are nothing of the sort. Science can be a wonderful thing. Um, and in fact, science is probably what's helping us uh, combat this pandemic, so is reason. Um, so I don't want to say like, oh, reason is bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. And that's not what Foucault is claiming. It's not that reason is bad. It's that we might be led into a false sense of security thinking that reason is the guiding light of society. It's a very useful tool and we should learn how to use it. In fact, a lot of people in this crisis should. But is it really the way to like, pro like is our society really actually progressing because of it? Um, think about all the problems we have. Is it really actually helping? I don't know. Now, Foucault's project, his, especially as a, as a historian, is to critique the impact of reason on modern Western society. Critique does not mean reject. It means taking a very close look at. 
How does he intend to do that? Well, by looking at the West's changing understanding of deviance from the norm and how to deal with it. Specifically, and this is what we're going to be going over, the histories of madness, law-breaking and punishment, and the regime of discipline that has emerged in the modern era. We do live in a rational society to an extent, but Foucault is saying that's not necessarily a good thing and maybe we're not using the best parts of reason. Uh, especially when you consider what's normal and how normalcy is shaped. What is normal? Normal is a word we're going to be going over a lot this unit, so just keep an eye on that. So again, uh, this is all in the reading, by the way, but this is a kind of a sneak peek of what we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, the critiquing the impact of reason on modern Western societies. Okay, here's another vocab word I'm going to throw at you. Normalization. And this is a really good one. You could replace this with what they taught you in 11th grade, which is socialization, but this one's a little more hardcore. Normalization is the process by which a culture encourages people to conform to the established standard of conduct. In other words, you are expected to do certain things in a society. You have to uh, give up some of your personal freedoms and, and desires and wants in order to fit in, in a society. That, that's just the way it has to be. But normalization is the process by which a culture gets you to do what it wants, to conform to its, its standards. And again, this can be a good thing and a bad thing. I don't want to throw out and say normalization bad. It's not that simple. You have to a degree be normalized. I mean, you have to like be potty trained, for instance. We don't want you just crapping anywhere. Um, but it can also be a bad thing because it can also squelch creativity. It can uh, destroy uh, criticism, uh, dissent, and those are really bad things to get rid of. But I want you to start thinking, how are you normalized? How is your behavior shaped, not by an institution or a government, by other people? Think about how power works. Power is a relationship, and it's not just top down. It's also existing within peers. And by the way, nowhere is this more evident than in social media. Uh, give me 10. Oh God, I hate that stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of like, you know, these weird memes that go around. I mean, memes are a great example of this. Um, when you really stop and think about it, social media, and I know a lot of us are on social media because, you know, can't really go outside. But there's a lot of weird behavior shaping uh, norms that exist in social media. When you think about like, what's what you can post, what you shouldn't post, what kind of picture, uh, what kind of content, uh, how to behave. That's all normalized when you really stop and think about it. Now, I bring up social media in particular because that's what Mr. Silva is going to be covering uh, in much more detail in SI. So just keep in mind how you could apply Foucault's theories to social media, in particular things like Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, etc., etc. So I want to introduce you to probably uh, one of Foucault's most famous uh, terms, the panopticon. Now, you might have heard of the phrase before, the panopticon. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background. And again, I will be going over this in more detail when you switch over to philosophy. But the panopticon is essentially a, so originally it was a physical structure. It was an actual building. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, a, uh, uh, an English 19th century philosopher, he was challenged to design a perfect prison. He wanted to, the king wanted him to design a prison. And so he came up with the idea of the panopticon, a circular building in which there was, uh, the cells are arranged in a ring around a central tower. Uh, let me kind of draw it for you. So I have here my little whiteboard. <laughs> Here, one second. Let's blow up the. Uh... There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So here's my very crude drawing, but uh, imagine this is like from a bird's eye view, like top down. So the panopticon was a physical building that uh, was again a ring. So imagine each of these are like individual cells, like where the prisoners would be held. In the center was a guard tower. So this is where the guards would be. Now, there would be a constant light shining on the prisoners. And, oh, you guys can't see? Hold on. Uh, let me go a little closer. Uh, okay. So anyway, 
the guards in the center, in the center tower, they could see into the cells at all times. However, the prisoners cannot see the tower, so it's one way. Now, the prisoners have no idea when the guards are looking at them. It's possible that there are no guards in there at all. It's just these constant lights would always be shining on them. So there's always the, the implicit threat of being watched. And so if a prisoner tried to do something or make a break for it, they might be shot, uh, but they would never know. And so that constant anxiety is what kept the prisoners in line. Now, uh, that sounds horrible, and uh, it was so horrible that even the king, when he received Jeremy Bentham's design of the Panopticon, commented, I don't know, Bentham, that actually seems pretty cruel. Can you imagine that? Uh, an English monarch saying something is too cruel? <laughs> Yikes. And in fact, Panopticons um, are actually, some of them actually have been constructed um, in some countries. I know that there's an infamous one in Cuba, for instance. They are actually illegal, uh, I think, I believe, by some Geneva War Convention. Uh, it is illegal to have a Panopticon. It is considered extremely inhumane. Because imagine having zero privacy. You're always being watched. You're always being monitored. Yeah, not great. So this is the way the Panopticon is structured. Uh, again, a central tower with guards that are always looking at the prisoners in these cells, but the prisoners cannot look at the tower. The one really important thing to note in the Panopticon is also this. It's not just the guards who see the prisoners. Who else sees the prisoners? That's right, the fellow prisoners. So it's not just a central authority keeping you in line, it's also your peers. Your uh, fellow prisoners are also keeping you in line. And you never know when you're actually being watched or not. Uh, and so that's the Panopticon. Now, what Foucault was talking about is, okay, not necessarily a physical like structure, a physical prison, but he, would, he did adopt the phrase Panopticon to describe our society. And he says that we do live in a Panopticon, or to use his phrase, a disciplinary society, where everyone is constantly being monitored and where you are constantly monitoring other people. Uh, oh, I've seen the comments. Uh, yes, I remember uh, uh, the gaze of the other. Yes, actually Foucault was influenced a lot by Sartre and that uh, idea that you're always being watched and that's what makes you uncomfortable. And so in this dynamic, there's no escape. If you're a prisoner in here, you're always under threat of being monitored. Maybe you're not actually being seen, but the threat's always there and that's what always fills you with some anxiety and then this uh, overwhelming desire to want to conform to avoid it. All right, well, that was art with Mr. Fuentes. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Circle on back to the lecture. All right. <clears throat> so that's the panopticon. <clears throat> Okay, so there is another kind of vocab word, and it's an adjective, um, panoptical, so having to do with this idea of the panopticon. Again, not necessarily referring to the physical prison, more having to do with the method of surveillance by which modern society regulates its members. Okay, especially those of you who are going to be with Mr. Silva, I would recommend either uh, copying this down, just make a quick note of it. And again, this video will be made available later on. Uh, I'm going to upload it to YouTube, so don't worry about that. But I would kind of make a note so you can understand it. So again, having to do with the method of surveillance by which modern society regulates its members. Rather than use brute force to control subjects, a state can use individually internalized coercion. In other words, many modern states no longer have to send somebody over to your house to threaten you. Um, instead, now they can do it from afar. Either we're talking about government surveillance, like with the Patriot Act, but we're also talking about social media. Guys, when you think about how pervasive social media is, like it's actually really scary. Um, Silva will be going over that in much more detail. I mean, privacy is a very precious commodity now, if it exists at all. And in a lot of ways, the government doesn't have to monitor something like your location because you reveal your own location all the time on social media. Oh, I'm at so-and-so grabbing so-and-so. Oh, look at me, I grab this. You are advertising your own information. I mean, when you really think about it, um, I forget who said it, but somebody was mentioning about Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. One of the greatest uh, tricks, he says, that Facebook was able to sell is instead of calling themselves a data collection agency, they call themselves a social networking site. 
Um, it's crazy. We volunteer all of that information on our own. And so the government doesn't have to like spy on you. I know we have all those jokes about like, oh, my FBI agent. It's unnecessary. Why would an FBI agent have to look at you if you are posting all of your ideas and all of your locations and activities and hobbies for everyone to see? Again, more on that later. <laughs> but we do live in a panoptical society. And so your behavior is normalized by other people and you don't have to uh, uh, be physically coerced into, in, in, into behaving the way that we want you to behave as a society. Um, you are regulated by other people and without even realizing it, you regulate others. <laughs> Think of that. <laughs> when you go on Instagram later today, take a much more critical look at what people post and what they, uh, and what they say and what they do. It's very interesting. Which, by the way, just a quick personal note, that's why I was off social media for a long time. I know a lot of people ask you, like, Fuentes, why did you get rid of your Instagram, you know, at the beginning of the school year? And to be honest, I, I really don't like the idea of social media because of Foucault. Um, I, I think it really does sh shape and normalize your behavior in a way that can be very unhealthy. The reason I have returned to social media, and it was a very conscious decision, is because we are in an emergency, and I needed a way to be in contact with people in a quick and informal way. And so I very consciously am using social media as a tool, um, but I'll be honest, I think as soon as this you know, crisis is over, I think I'm gonna get off it again. Um, and again, if you think that's silly of me, that, that's fair, but I will hope to explain my point of view. And again, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe Foucault is wrong. Maybe there's a huge benefit to being part of the Panopticon. I remember last year, there was a minority of uh, my students who would say like, oh, we live in a Panopticon? That's okay, that makes us feel more secure. That's interesting. I think your generation is being raised without a lot of concepts of privacy, which to me is very interesting, because I know a lot of you are being raised um, with phones, with social media, and as you get, uh, as the generations get younger and younger, I think it just becomes more normal. Like, I remember a time when, you know, social media was not a thing, you know? Uh, it, you did something dumb in middle school, and you know, you did it, and then everyone forgot about it. But now things are there forever, um, and they follow you. I will demonstrate to you uh, through Foucault and through my lessons through Foucault how that is can be a good thing. You know, it can shape your behavior in a positive way, but it can also be a bad thing. And that's why a lot of really toxic uh, worldviews still exist. Um, that's why racism still exists. That's why sexism still exists um, because of this extreme socialization. But I digress. Okay. Let's get to this concept that I'm gonna bring up a lot more of this unit, especially with the next philosopher we're gonna cover, Richard Rorty. But there's this idea of the truth. The truth is being this like, you know, wholly objective, you know, fact, like something that cannot be denied. Foucault has a very interesting point of view on the truth. Most of us assume that the truth is a good thing, the truth is what we should strive towards, you know, uh, the truth is good. Foucault has a very interesting point of view. Foucault says, the truth is bad. In fact, he says the truth is what imprisons you inside the panopticon. Let me explain. Truth, let me give you Foucault's definition. According to Foucault, the truth is simply a category of power, not an epistemological category. Meaning, according to Foucault, truth has nothing to do with knowledge and everything to do with power. That what that means is, and again, I, this is just the introduction, I'll be going way more into detail about it later, but basically what that means is, when you say, yeah, yeah, that's true, it is an exercise of power relationships in a society, not a statement of fact, because at the end of the day, what we're, all we're really doing is using words, language, more on that in a second. But I want you to understand, truth is not necessarily something objective is not necessarily a fact it's more of like a statement that you play a language game in uh, if you want to use the you know to kind of combine Foucault and Wittgenstein it's like a moving a power game um, and who gets to control the truth who gets to say what's true and what's not um, this is a hallmark of postmodernism, uh, criticizing the idea of an objective truth. Now, I want you to think very, very, very deeply and critically about this, because maybe the postmoderns are wrong. I've actually gotten into a lot of arguments with uh, Mr. Lin, you know, I've been keeping in contact with him and calling him. And, uh, you know, this, this current uh, epidemic, I'm sorry, pandemic, is uh, really making us question, uh, you know, what we've been teaching about postmodernism and criticizing the truth. 
is it actually useful to say, oh, there's no objective truth? Like, isn't there an objective truth about uh, COVID-19? I don't know. I don't want to deny the usefulness of science. And I don't want to say like, you know, science is bad. Um, I think more what I what I want to steer towards is thinking, okay, when we say, you know, um, wash your hands to try and avoid the spread of COVID-19. I think my concern is not necessarily, is that an objective truth? Because there's no way for us to verify if it's like 100% objective, but is it useful? And do we trust the people that are telling us that information? To me, that's a whole separate question. Again, more on that later. This is just the introduction. For the millionth time, oh, gotta turn this up. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I don't regret this at all. Any truth that we make is, you know, really wholly human constructed and is a product of time and chance and uh, to add on to that, and power. So we haven't... Uh, forgotten our favorite uh, Austrian philosopher of language. He'll be making uh, appearances here and there this unit. So just make sure that you, uh, you know, try to keep that connection in mind. <laughs> oh, too good. Okay, so let's put two and two together. Let's relate this to you. Plenty of groups insist on spreading the truth. These include sciences, schools, churches, governments, political parties, courts of law, etc., etc. But, and here's something I think is very interesting. Foucault says, the primary goal of all institutions is not to find the truth. It's to bring human beings under control in various ways. But not in some cruel and malicious way. It's for the sake of social stability and survival. So in other words, Every institution that you're a part of, whether it's school or, or church, or heck, even a family unit, is all about bringing you under control. The whole purpose of any institution is to control its members. Ideally, it's for the sake of social stability and survival, because sometimes you need that. If everyone just kind of did their own thing, we would not survive very long. We are a social species. We need each other to survive. So you can't just have everyone just kind of doing their own thing. However, I think there are ways in which social institutions can abuse this power and can misapply it in ways that don't promote social stability and survival for everybody. And especially when you get into issues of, of justice, when you get into issues of you know, abuse of power, then you can really start to see it. But I want you guys to think critically. Your institution is not there to make you happy. Your institution is not there to you know, seek the truth in the world. No, your institution is there to provide control. And this includes everything, every institution that you're a part of, including da, 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 school. Uh, I know, I wish I could go back to, but I know, you know, it's really funny. I never thought much about our campus. Um, it's not the prettiest campus, and especially not right now with all the construction going on. But I think a lot of us uh, kind of miss going to school. And not because you miss necessarily the, the lessons or all the work. I think it's because you miss the people and you miss the social interaction. I mean, that's kind of like, you know, what school's about. So in thinking about school, uh, in thinking about school, and in particular, like what the purpose of school is, I want you guys to think about it. Like, okay, right now, we, we as teachers have been instructed to continue to provide education, continue to provide lessons. But why? Question for you. And I'll pause after I ask this. What's the point of school? Here's a hint. It's not to learn. What do you think the point of school is? Take a moment. I'll, I know there's a little bit of a delay in this feed, but uh, type in something in the chat. What's the point of school? Because I would say it's not to learn. If you really wanted to learn, you, there's so many resources, especially now online. I mean, there's the library, there's the internet, there's, you know, other people. You don't really have to go to school to learn. So what's the point of school? Ah, Tiffany, social interaction. Yes, that's a huge one. Yeah, of course, it's, it's, to, it's to interact socially with, with your classmates, with your teachers. Uh, good, good. What else, though? 
Jared, to normalize people. Yep. Josh, yes, to keep you out of trouble so we know all our kids are in one place at once. Uh, Tiffany, that's a much more um, uh, a positive outlook. Yeah, to be exposed to different points of view. I mean, at the very least, that's a, that would be a good school. Though not a school where you have like, I don't know, like a 90% Hispanic population from the same neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Oh, for those of you just tuning in, I will be uploading this lecture in its entirety uh, in you know today, like probably in an hour or so, so you can take a look at it later. Let's see. Um, ooh, I like that, Cal. To create a common base of knowledge for the truth to be taught by other institutions. Uh, yes, that's a huge purpose of school. Good, good. Uh, what else? Yes, Nolan, structure path. I mean, look, why do you think I am asking you to wake up at 10 in the morning to watch my lectures? Uh, I mean, honestly, you don't have to, especially since I'm going to be uploading them on YouTube later. It's because to an extent, human beings crave structure. We need structure. Structure gives us a sense of security. It gives us a peace of mind. It reduces anxiety. Structure is not necessarily a bad thing. Structure and discipline can be good. But I want you to start thinking what the purpose of those institutions are. And the purpose of school, ladies and gentlemen, is not to learn. If it was, if the purpose was what, I mean, of course it's one of our objectives. I mean, don't get me wrong, at least it should be. But the primary objective is to keep you in control and to normalize you. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because it has to happen to some degree. Um, when you think about like the people that are still going outside in this quarantine and going out and doing all sorts of dumb stuff, a lot of people are shaming them on social media. Well, shaming is a technique of normalization that we'll go over later. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because we want people to stay indoors. But now I also want you to think about how it can be used in an evil way, in a, in a bad way, in an immoral way. We'll go over that later. Okay, good, 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 good. Good, okay, so all that is the purpose of schooling. Uh, it, it's as an institution. So I'm going to bring up this phrase again and again, but you live in what's called a disciplinary society. Oh, sorry. Just go back for one second. A disciplinary society. This is a phrase that I'm going to be using again and again, and it's kind of um, a synonym. It's interchangeable with the phrase panopticon. Uh, it's like this idea that you live in a society in which uh, you are constantly being monitored. You are, your actions are constantly recorded. Um, evaluated, you are graded, <laughs> quite literally as yes, students, uh, but you're more like graded like meat, if you guys know about how, how, how you know, the USDA grades meat. And so you are constantly being shaped and normalized, your behavior and your beliefs. But what I want you to start to realize is how much you do it to others. You normalize behaviors by treating other people a certain way, and I want you to think about which behaviors you're normalizing, and are they good, are they bad? I want you to become aware of what's happening, and I want you to become aware that we do all live in a disciplinary society, especially in the age of government surveillance and social media. So I think Foucault uh, has a lot to teach us, and I think he uh, uh, you know, has a lot of value to say, and a lot of value to add to our conversations regarding philosophy, um, economics, uh, sociology, psychology. I mean, there's just so many impacts w about what he's saying. And so I want you to start thinking about what a what power is, um, what a disciplinary society is, and what n it means to be normal. Tomorrow, we are, and again, I'm sorry, uh, tomorrow's lecture uh, is for those of you on philosophy. For those of you in SI, Mr. Silva will be preparing his own lectures very soon. Uh, and so, you know, tune in to uh, what he has to say. Um, however, my office hours are available to everyone. If you just like to pop in and chat, we can do that. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I am going to post uh, the link to my office hours, uh, Zoom. I will be there, uh, let's see, it's around, oh, 11, perfect. Uh, let's go ahead and give everyone 15 minutes. So let's say at 11.15, I will uh, be on Zoom to answer any questions. Or if you just want to chat or continue the conversation. But in other words, I think Foucault, so as a quick summary, as a quick recap of today's lecture, Foucault is a highly critical philosopher and historian, and he wants us to look more carefully at how power works in a relationship, and how, uh, I'm sorry, how power works in a society, as a relationship between people, and also how language influences the way that we behave and then the way that other people behave. Uh, so start thinking about that. Um, yeah, hopefully you can start relating this, especially those of you who are stuck on social media all day. Uh, 
go outside, take a deep breath, be by yourself, and uh, start thinking about it. If you'd like to read ahead, I've actually, again, for you philosophy folks, I've actually posted uh, the reading schedule uh, for the rest of the semester, at the very least until the quarantine is over, uh, and it is accessible via Schoology. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. We'll be in touch. Uh, otherwise, I will be here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and deliver uh, the next lecture. We are going to get into the history of madness, or who do we consider to be crazy? I really need you to do the reading. I know the reading, uh, you know, it might be tough or uh, stressful to read now, but read. Uh, it's, uh, in my opinion, very interesting, and it might be a welcome distraction. If you want to read ahead, you're more than welcome to do so. I will be posting daily discussion boards every day, so, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, tomorrow, we're going to analyze just who we consider to be mad or crazy and how we treat them today compared to centuries ago. Because Foucault says, we assume that we are much more humane towards, uh, you know, the mad today. You know, oh, mental illness. Oh, you know, so-and-so has, you know, this sort of mental condition. But he wants us to realize, no, we're actually pretty barbaric, uh, just in a different way than we used to be. Not better, just different. That'll be tomorrow's. All right, so somebody suggested that I have some uh, outro music, so here it is. Uh, the theme for today. <laughs> Again, if you have any questions, join me on Zoom. Uh, and uh, if you have anything at all you want to chat about, we'll check in. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow at 10. Uh, have a wonderful day. Stay busy, stay sane, stay safe, stay productive. Wash your hands, stay six feet away from other people. Bye. So again, join me on Zoom. Join me on Zoom. I will be opening it up at 11.15 guys, give me a minute to use the restroom. And I gotta set this, gotta set it up. <laughs> <laughs>